Welcome back to the Tuesday Weekend, the podcast for those of us who know that a Vichy Swa is just a potato leek soup that somebody forgot to warm up. <laughs> the segment you've all been waiting for, how to make soup. A good place to start with soup is stock. If you are just using water, you're missing out on worlds of flavor. So when I was at the Mariposa, I had two 40-gallon steam kettles and a 30-gallon tilt skillet that I could use. The tilt skillet I would usually, because it got used a lot in a lot of different ways by a lot of different people in that kitchen, I would just do my vegetable stock in that because I could usually get that in and out and cleaned in under two hours. But the steam kettles, usually I had one with chicken stock and the other with what we call posa stock, which was a really rich stock made from roasted veal bones. Both of those would go overnight. And yeah, the posa stock was so just deep and rich that once we drained the bones, we would cover them again in cold water and let that go another night, making what's called a remi. And though it's weaker than the initial stock, when you reduce it a bit, it is still way better than a lot of the commercial stocks that you can buy in stores. So D, let's start with stocks. Okay, so stocks are a foundation of a lot of soups. And a lot of people make the misconception that stocks are usually the scraps left over from the kitchen. Have you come across this, Nick? When uh, you've seen your mom make soup and stuff, does she use good ingredients or does she use the scraps from the kitchen? When she did make soups, then it was kind of the same sort of with my dad too. Um, my, my whole family can actually cook really well. I'm the bad cook. Oh no! I'm the I, but I can actually cook well. Just that there, like my younger brother with training would probably be a remarkable chef. Okay, he's the guy who looks in your fridge and goes, "Oh, okay," and then makes a soup. Oh right, yeah. yeah. So my mom would make soups. I mean, grew up on a farm and all that and stuff. So she would roast a chicken, and it was a two-purpose thing. It's like turkey as well. She would, she always used what was left over from the turkey after it was cooked to make the stock. Right, exactly. And it, and it, it wasn't like something that's like, oh, that's all. It's, I mean. We planned on having turkey noodle soup. It wasn't like, okay, I guess we can do this. I mean, like big chicken, it was the same. Uh, similar to a soup, my dad always liked his big thing. He loved making like ham hocks and navy beans. I was in Arizona in college and my mom was out of town for a week for work. So my dad was cooking. So my dad made ham hocks and beans for the week for him and my brother. Oh, yeah. My little brother refuses to eat them to this day. Oh, my God. He's like, we had that for lunch and dinner for a week. I'm just like, uh, he'd go to the store and buy the ham hock to make the soup. It wasn't right. something that was just left over that, oh, we can do something with that. So yeah. no, to your point, I would say my mom, I mean, we would use stuff that we had cooked, but she would buy stuff specifically to be used in a soup as well. It yeah. wasn't just like, oh, that's what we got left. Let's make a soup. Again, not just more like the chicken noodles, turkey noodles, simpler stuff like that. I mean, the pizzoli, all fresh ingredients for that. When it's yeah. made making a soups a lot like is making a regular meal there's a lot of work into it that the people don't it's not just throw it in a pot and walk away yeah you know, i would think so okay a couple of things that that i want to mention first because it is just the two of us we rarely roast a whole chicken yeah. but frequently because the chicken thigh is both of our favorite part of the bird it's the most flavorful it's just the best part and it's got that handy little bone in it so i will get the pack of bone in thighs bone them all like pull those out and then i've got a freezer bag that i just keep adding to and when it gets full i make stock though i also just want to start very fundamentally on what i put into stock so a vegetable stock here's a fun word mirepoix mirepoix it is traditionally one third carrot one third celery one third onion and throw a bay leaf in there and you're floating in the gravy boat Mirepoix is a French base for a lot of stocks. So um, not all stocks for all different types of varieties of soups culturally will have Mirepoix, but Mirepoix is a very good place to start if you're gonna learn about how to make stock. And there are some soups where you might even wanna do, for even just for a vegetable stock, half onion and then the other half mix between celery and carrot depending on the flavor you're looking for what the the end outcome there is right and then when i am doing a meat-based stock i always roast the bones because you just get better flavor out of the end product when you do so again even if the chicken thigh is raw pulling the the bones out and throwing that bone straight into the freezer when i pull them out i don't just dump them into the pot and then pour water over it 
I put them onto a roasting pan and throw them in the oven yeah, until they got the good co yeah. good color on it, and then you go into the pot. I also do tend to sweat out my mirepoix. Yeah. So before I add any water to it, cook them. You know, get them so they they just start to soften up a little bit. All the all those vegetables, and then you add your water. And again, it just it's drawing better flavor out. You get a better end product. So with the traditional French version of how to make a vegetable stock. So not only do you have the trinity of vegetables that make up the mirepoix, you also have the bay leaf, you also have fresh herbs, and you have black pepper. And uh, one of the things that I like to do when I make my stock, because stocks are usually used as flavoring to add to pull out a soup, to add that extra nuance, or to base for a broth-based soup. One of the things that I like to do, because as Nick said, that like the ingredients are very important in a soup. They shouldn't be an afterthought, right? But also, um, soups are a good way to use up products if you're in that type of situation. Oh, yes. So uh, if you can, and, and if you are able, and this is what most restaurants do, use your fresh ingredients. But if you're in a situation where you have a lot of leftovers, a lot of scraps, then go ahead and use it. But keep in mind that the scraps will deteriorate the quality of your stock. So like if you use the fresh vegetables, you use the fresh carcass, you roast it, you roast your vegetables, you or you saute your vegetables, it will affect your end product. And in the end, it will affect your end product of the soup. So just keep that in mind when you're making it. So you go and you make your mirepoix and you either add your protein, uh, whether you're doing chicken or, or fish or anything like that, the bones. And then you add your cold water into it. You let it simmer on low. You do not let it boil so you can have a clarified stock. And there's all different ways that you can do it. The French like to do beef, sto uh, beef stock by uh, having the traditional mirepoix of onions, carrots, and celery. And the other things that I mentioned, the herbs, the black pepper, the bay leaf. And then they take beef bones and they roast them. And they do this technique called pince which they then put tomato paste on the bones and roast the tomato paste onto the bones. And then they add in all the vegetables and do their cold water and it usually simmers for about 16 hours in a traditional French beef stock. Uh, ain't nobody got time for that yeah. <laughs> nowadays. So there's plenty, of, there's plenty of good bought products out there. There's a lot of good bouillon. For the home cook, they don't need to be simmering stock for uh, 16 to 24 hours. But if you have the capabilities, I say but, make but your do own it. stock. You know, how you let it go overnight without worrying about burning out your pot is set it basically as low as it goes while you still get an occasional bubble. You, you want the lowest like, simmer. You the lowest simmer that you can maintain. Change. And yes, moisture will evaporate. That is what you want. You want to reduce that flavor down, but you also don't want to burn everything. And you certainly don't want a kitchen fire. So yeah, low scant simmer. There are a lot of techniques nowadays when it comes to getting flavor quickly. Like uh, when I make a vegetable stock, I have to depend, think about what I'm using it for. If I'm making, I end up making a lot of vegetable based soups when I was working at Deer Valley and uh, some of the soups were vegan and they would be our vegan stews. And so I would have to think of in one, what concept is this stock being used? So like one of the things I used to do, I had a roasted root vegetable stew and I was like, oh, well, this is vegan. So I need to add a bit more flavor to it because we're a ski resort and people are coming and they're paying and they're doing their ski experience. And if they got subpar vegan soup then the experience is not <laughs> anymore it's not yeah. what i would do is i would do my mirepoix i would sweat it down and i would add extra vegetables to it so when i made my soup i would put red pepper in it as well to add that like uh color and then I would sweat down the vegetables. I would add salt so I can extract some of the flavors while I was cooking the stock, which I guess now made it a broth. So it was an addition of st uh, salt, right? And then I would deglaze the vegetables with white wine. Sure. 
So then I would, I would essentially call it like a fortified broth because I had white wine in it. And then it was a, a different level of flavor. So also how you treat your stocks and how you treat the base of your soups will determine how much flavor you'll have in the end product. Two things I want to throw in on that. And that is when you're making soup, so you have your mirepoix getting swept down, dry versus fresh herbs. If you're using dry herbs, you want to add them now. When your vegetables are sweat down, but before you deglaze it, before you add the water, because it will open those up. Fresh herbs, if you simmer them for four hours, you will lose whatever flavor they might have imparted. You want to add fresh herbs right at the end, because that's when they give the clearest pop of flavor. And then, yeah, the other thought which you did touch on is, yes, deglazing almost any soup stew chili that i make before i add the stock the once again once those vegetables are nice and, and getting cooked you add the white wine the red wine i mean in my chili i often use tequila there's all sorts of you you want to <laughs> mix like tequila <laughs> um well and tequila and chili i'm like hmm it, that's still my favorite things part of what you want to do is and especially Use a wooden spoon or a rubber spatula for this, but you all those little brown bits that the vegetables start to make on the bottom of the pan, that's flavor. And that's what you're trying that's the good stuff. So what you're trying to actually do with that liquid is to kind of get that all up, kind of redisperse it among you know what the, the base that you've got, and then you add your water and it, it just works out better. Well that that, that reminds me of uh, not so much a soup, but similar is like when my family's Italian, so we cook our own food, make our own noodles, even stuff like that, ravioli. But when you're making, just say spaghetti and meatballs, when you're browning and cooking the meatballs, you do that in the pot you're going to cook your sauce in. Yes. And you brown it around with the oil and all the flavor and all the herbs and everything else. Because that, then you add the tomato sauce and the tomato paste and everything else to make the sauce. And you've got all that flavor in there. If you don't do that, it's super bland. Oh, yeah. 100%. And like you said, all the little bits and stuff, yeah, you clean the pot before you put everything in, so it's all kind of floating. And then Note on deglazing. Perfect. <laughs> I get all that meat fond off of there. Mm -hmm. So uh, another uh, thing is soup thickeners, right? So in certain situations, like if you're going to make a, a creamy chicken noodle soup, like you, you make a chicken velouté pretty much in the pot while you're building the soup, right? So you have your chicken stock. It's off to the side, and you're building the soup already. So you have your sweated down onions and, and vegetables that you're going to have. So then you add flour to your oil or butter mixture or whatever fat you have. And then that you're going to create something called a roux. So all that precious stock that you made is now going to go into this velouté for this creamy chicken noodle soup. After you make your roux, which is like a flour and oil slash butter paste, depending on what the fat is in certain circumstances it will be chicken fat in certain circumstances it will be canola oil because you're making something vegan or in certain circumstances it might be beef fat or pork fat whatever it is you're making a roux and one of the things you want to do after you make the roux is deglaze it to get all the fond all the flavor off the bottom of the pan so there's another another good technique to use to make your creamy base soup before you add in your stock. So you're going to deglaze it, let that uh, alcohol or whatever it is cook down to all sec, which is a French term to nearly dry. And then you'll add in your stock slowly and then you keep the soup at a simmer. And you want to add your soup slowly because Rue has a tendency to turn into little, little granules <laughs> if you're not whisking or so you always got to make sure you're stirring when you're adding your first uh, addition of stock so that's why deglazing also helps with the roux because it will incorporate some liquid for beforehand and then you can slowly add in your stock and you'll end up with a smoother velouté uh a smoother soup absolutely well and then there's one more trick that i learned years ago that i use with chicken stock in particular though any poultry stock even my beef stock it, it works and that is to add some gel to it throw in a couple of chicken feet 
and boy does he love his chicken I feet do, again roast them first and you can overdo it and there's absolutely <laughs> you can make a chicken feet stock that will taste like a chicken feet stock and if you don't know what i mean go down to the asian market but get yourself some and try it when it's cool it will be this absolute perfect gel that i mean it, it almost like a ballistics gel it's so just thick but the flavor it's, it's won't be great for soup dumplings it's but... absolutely great for soup dumplings but even just adding a couple to your chicken stock just because all that gelatin in the feet really does it like well gelatin it will help it really set up and it gives it just an, another kind of layer of viscosity in there that really works nicely so the equivalent for uh pork would be the pork feet because they're very gelatinous yeah, exactly. and then the other the pork um, knuckles yeah, or, or the feet yes yeah. and then um the other equivalent would be for bone bone marrow and uh the beef broth right like yeah. uh, nick was talking yeah. earlier about bone stock like the reason why they're so flavorful is they'll pin say or put the uh, tomato paste on the bones or maybe not use that step and just use the straight bone but they use the bone marrow and so that flavoring and that uh gelatin that's in that side cut of the uh beef bones is what really adds the extra level to the stock and and of course you can always reduce your stocks down and freeze them after you make them if you don't need them all yes. for your soup they can be for later soup oh my goodness i like uh later soup prep too that's very nice makes your weeknights very easy yeah i should do that sometime because my weeknights end at like midnight <laughs> oh should i come down to san diego and meal prep for you nick is this is what you're saying Sure. Yeah. I mean, you'll have to, you'll have to visit the zoo and the beach and stuff and go sailing, but you would have to meal prep as well. Yes. Uh, a little side note too, on the chicken feet, uh, once a year at Sundance, uh, we did a party for the Louisiana film commission at Epic. So, you know, 800, 900 people, and they had a whole thing going on, all new Orleans, all voodoo stuff like that. And they had a specific drink cocktail list they wanted us to make, which was fine, except for they forgot that they were in a uh, park city. So their bloody Mary mix froze. Oh no. <laughs> oh no. So all of a sudden, we're like me and the other bartenders are like, "Well, can't really microwave this because if it cooks at all, it's gonna just destroy it." Oh yeah. <laughs> so we're so fortunately, one of us that would be me is also actually worked in a kitchen. I'm like, "Well, we've got sinks, right?" Yeah, and I'm like, "It's in plastic bag." Like, yeah, and I'm like, "Turn on some hot water, put them in the sinks, just defrost it that way." Yeah. But the garnish on that was chicken's was a chicken's foot. <laughs> an actual pickled chicken's foot. Wow. I mean, I finally, I was finally like, screw it. And I just grabbed it. And I'm like, I'm like, that's not too bad. And like one girl like goes and runs away to get sick. I'm just like, it's really, we're serving these all day. You have to get used to watching people eat them. I've absolutely used them as an ingredient in a stock but I have never served one to another person to consume. Uh, it's a uh, Korean sh street food. They do yeah. like deep fried chicken free oh, sure. feet and they'll eat it uh, with uh, a beer in like their street markets and stuff. So it's like a big, but they also wear like special gloves cause like, you know, the chicken yeah. balls are still on it when they're eating it and then they're just yeah. like eating their beer. It's like their beer snack. I, I, I would not say it's something I would like do like that. I think doing it on the dare or bet that I had going to do it in the first place was fine. And it wasn't really that bad, but it's not something like, Ooh, that's good. I want that again. Oh, yeah. Like this is what I, I'm craving right now. Yeah. yeah. That means I, I win on that Facebook post every single time. What have you eaten chicken's feet? Yep. It's like, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, Speaking of that, that's a really good uh, reason to explain the next topic. Soup garnish. Yeah, garnish are, is very important. And Josh, will you tell us more about that? Well, so you just made this beautiful soup that you want to lovingly nourish your family with, but it's missing just something. That little, oh, maybe it's crouton, maybe it's crackers, oyster that, crackers. That je ne sais quoi, you That's know. Yeah. One of my favorite, and of course this isn't, it wasn't my idea, it's been done a bunch, but I had a spectacular cheddar soup in Wisconsin that was garnished with popcorn, and it was just a bowl of happiness to me but even if it's just a little a Josh, your midwest is showing <laughs> i didn't i've never garnished a soup with fried cheese curds but now i want to anyway but i was about to say fresh fresh herbs you know might be a little bit 
just a or little flavored oils. Chives. Yeah, exactly. Flavored oils on top. Yeah, I've served a lot of soups like that where they're frequently put like well, four drops of oil, and you can see in a nice little pattern on top, like yeah. maybe like a, a something like a greenish oil and a red soup or something. It also I mean, gives a nice color contrast. Like tomato soup. I yeah. would often do basil oil, basil oil, yeah. and then a little bit of of uh, grated parmesan, and it looks beautiful. It tastes great. Yeah, I know. I know. Aurora was very fond of her goat cheese foam that one year. She knows what I'm talking about. Oh yes. And I actually have some uh, deep fried uh, wheat strings that I have from the soup that I made this week, which was ironically was... potato and leek soup. <laughs> I actually have used. Yeah, fried leek greens as garnish quite a bit because yeah. they, they look cool. Or even fried shallots. Oh, fried they, shallots, yeah. yeah. Or um, um, if you get a, a soup that is New Orleans, like what would you call it? gumbo? Uh, and uh, one of the garnishes I've used are etouffee, uh, fried okra. Yeah. Fried I, I, I worked at a place called Black Eyed Pea back in college, and it was like fresh southern food like chicken fried chicken chicken fried steak fried okra uh -huh. you know, red beans and rice and all that and like that that was that was that wasn't like a side that was on the menu where he's like oh yeah. oh yeah fried okra and it was actually pretty good yeah i love fried okra yeah it's just people like that's disgusting you're like uh-huh or drop them i'll just yeah, eat that when it's done right yeah when it's and done right like, well no because when it's not done right then it's just a snotty uh yeah. piece of yeah. broccoli or whatever yeah it's yeah. Yeah. But um, now, and also, like when I would eat, like when I go and eat soups like that, and they're garnished as you two are both describing, which, like people, I'm like, oh, that looks great and stuff, and then I stir, like, why are you stirring the soup? And I'm like, because that's part of the flavor, and I'm not supposed to eat around it. Right. Oh yeah. Right. You yes. know, it's like when it comes out, there's your beautiful presentation, and then oh, it's it it and then, just, then stir it so everything goes in, and then that next sip. I mean, it, from the bartender standpoint, it's almost like putting down a scotch and saying, take a sip, and then taking a straw and adding one drop of water. And they're going, now take a sip. And people are like, whatever. And they're like, that's entirely, I'm like, it's entirely different. Yeah. yeah. Um, I will say I am the, oh, no, I'm no longer because they had the chili cook off this past weekend and I had to be at work. So I'm no longer the reigning Alpine County chili champion. But for my chili last year, because a lot of people, it's like that, that sour cream note, a lot of people like. And there was definitely uh, just enough heat in there that you wanted that little bit of dairy to balance it out. But what I ended up doing was taking a, this is going to sound cheap, a packet of ranch dressing mix and some cream cheese and mixing those together and then just taking a little canal, just a little tiny, like, it's, but it's I, a football, it's like a football shape. Okay. What did you make with two spoons? It's, it's a French technique. And it's like the thing that you always see on like fancy uh, dessert plates. That's what a quenelle is. All right. A dollar. Uh, okay. yeah. I was going to say just dollar. dollar. Yeah. dollar. Uh, yeah. But that really, I think is what put the whole thing over the top was just that little, I mean, first of all, it wasn't just sour cream to, you know, mellow the heat, but it was, a flavor and it just kind of a thing on its own. It was a different temperature, a different uh, viscosity is the rest of it. It's it just kind of a contrast there. And I think it worked really great. Now, I joke about this with friends and stuff. So what was the chili that you made to win the contest? All right. So it was grilled pumpkin, some grilled flank steak, and a bunch of espresso. So I, baked, I did a pumpkin spice latte chili. And I'm, that's not the part I joke about because that sounds absolutely fantastic. This is the story I tell friends. Yeah, my buddy Josh, who is an incredible chef, apparently got bored and entered a chili contest yeah. in a small county in Nevada. Uh, no, it's in California. It was it's in California. California. Okay, let's say in, in California. So I am guarantee there's some lady there named Madge. And like her biggest thing is that she wins the chili competition every single year. And like she beats the restaurants and everybody knows Madge and her chili's always great. It's like, oh, what's Madge going to do this year for the chili cook-off? Because she's not going to do the same chili. Then here comes Josh, all smiling and happy and setting up and all like everyone else has a little booth and he's got like basically a restaurant kitchen set up that he's just done on his own with everyone staring going like, who's that guy? And then he comes out with his pumpkin latte chili yeah. that is fantastic. And, you know, Madge is now just left in the dust like, well, yeah, that guy's a chef. You know, I, yes. I make grilled cheese sandwiches for lunch. That's that's, that's I don't do that for a living. It's I just always thought like it's got to suck to be like, I'm really good at this. This is a lot of fun. 
who's the new guy? Oh, he's a chef. Oh, no. To all the matches out there, I will still eat your chili. Oh, okay. oh absolutely. I, I love home cooking that I don't have to cook myself. So so but, don't get me wrong. Uh, um, to all the matches out there, we still love you. But but Nick's not wrong. I had a cassette burner. I had a, I have a small portable propane grill. I it's you had a whole setup. I had a whole setup. It yeah, but I, 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 if you wouldn't have taken a picture, I would have just assumed that you just built a mini kitchen there to cook in. Like if I could have gotten the permits for the hood system. Anyway, yeah. all right, we are <laughs> going to take a break here because when we come back, all right, it's impossible to answer what a favorite soup is, so we're going to take a swing at maybe a tier list here. So stay tuned. We will be back with more soupy goodness.